we're welcoming today Brent McCrossan, CEO of Audiosocket.com. And Brett's going to be speaking at Tech Week Chicago, and he's been nice enough to allow himself to be interviewed ahead of the conference, and we want to say welcome to Mr. McCrossan. Brent, are you there? I sure am, Dave. Thank you very much for taking the time to connect with me today. Well, thank you. Thank you very much, Brent. And uh, we'll, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll start off with um, a little bit about uh, your story and AudioSocket and how it's tying into your presenting as a keynote speaker at the upcoming Tech Week Chicago 2014. But it's really interested in the uh, concept of what AudioSocket does and how you came to be running uh, the company, which is really at the intersection of music and technology in a way, correct? Oh, absolutely. Uh, couldn't be more accurate. And it, you know, admittedly, I think, <clears throat> which is the case for for most entrepreneurs and people who pursue their passions and purely whatever they may be, um, you know, our, our arrival to where uh, Audio Socket is today has been quite a, 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 a long and, and twisted journey. And, and by twisted, I just mean we've gone a number of different routes that maybe we hadn't predicted we would go uh, in an effort to continue to pursue the unknown and to innovate. Um, and it certainly has a, allowed us to kind of arrive, if you will, uh, very deeply rooted uh, at the corner and the intersection of, of music and technology. And for me, you know, I, the way I got here, at least in the early days, was it started out uh, with my grandfather. He was a bit of a prankster, and I guess, you know, he wanted to get even with my parents. So when I was four years old, he started buying me drums, and he would not stop <laughs> buying me drums until I was about eight, and finally my parents said, forget this, just give the kid lessons and let him pursue it, because he's obviously not going to quit playing. Um, so I've been a musician all my life, and mm -hmm. um, you know, when I was a youngster, high school primarily, maybe a little early college, I was playing in bands uh, as a drummer, mostly uh, you know, being in the early to mid-90s, as it were. It was alternative rock bands. And then in my mid-20s, I wound up moving to Seattle, Washington, kind of on a whim. Um, you know, I, life in New Orleans was perfect. Uh, food was great. and get a job wherever I wanted. Uh, and I just wanted a challenge. So I moved to Seattle. I was playing in some bands up there. And, you know, honestly enough, having a pretty hard time anchoring myself up there. People in New Orleans are incredibly social, and nobody knows a stranger. Uh, in Seattle, it's quite yeah. the opposite. People don't really like to talk to strangers. So um, <laughs> rather than, than just move back home, I decided I wanted to bring something to Seattle from my own home culture to see if it could make me feel more rooted. So I started doing these big Mardi Gras parties in Seattle. Uh, you know, we rented out a massive venue, three floors, three stages. We hired brass bands, and we're doing unpermitted parades down the streets with horns and tubas and marching drums. <laughs> nice just flipped it on their head and that kind of got me unintentionally in the music business. I went from being a drummer uh, to a guy who was now a promoter and from there venues started asking me to become their in-house talent buyer so I had a company that controlled the, the music booking exclusively for three Seattle music venues and then from that I found some artists who I really believed in and I started to manage their careers and while I was enjoying that I also saw, you know, kind of felt that it wasn't going to be exactly the career path I wanted permanently. Um, didn't know exactly where I was headed next in the music business, but I wanted to be in it. And uh, a couple of our artists, we got their music placed into some TV shows and some video games, and that's when the light bulb went off. I thought, you know, instead of managing artists and dealing with all the sensitivity that comes with managing creative people, I know what that's like. I am one. If I only had more music and more genres and a technology that I could use to make all that content searchable, searchable and uh, instantly available for licensing, then I could scale that as a business. And uh, mm -hmm. it wouldn't matter if the, you know, the drummer quit the band because the guitar player slept with his girlfriend or whatever drama could happen. I right. had the music right. and I had the right to sell it. So... Um, you know, we could build that into a successful business. And it's really through that 
kind of personal exploration in being a musician and seeking an effort to, uh, you know, bring music to people that the idea of Audio Socket was born. Right, right. And, and really, uh, with, with, uh, with those roots and kind of bringing it into Seattle and getting that, that mix of uh, creative and the arts and then the very heavy tech scene in Seattle, you find yourself at the crossroads of, of pulling these two industries together, right, and, and, and starting, to, to, uh, starting Audio Socket or the, the, the roots of what would become Audio Socket, correct? Yeah, absolutely, certainly. And, you know, originally, quite honestly, we didn't, in the, in the first days of the company, we thought we were a music company and we just happened to need some technology. But we quickly realized that we were a technology company that happened to license music. And, this, and that's a pretty mm. critical difference in thinking, even though it's just slightly inverted, right? Um, mm -hmm, but, mm -hmm. you know, I'd say six months after we started the company, we realized that the technology we had originally outsourced was just fundamentally not going to scale as wide and deep as we wanted, that we had concepts around innovation that we had not seen in the industry that we wanted to deploy, but we weren't going to be able to provide those innovations by just outsourcing our technology. We needed to own it. We needed to become experts in it and bring in a level of expertise from the technological proficiency side. And we did. We found a, a CTO who is certainly um, one of the top engineers in the, company, in the country, a brilliant guy. And he was, he was able to take the ideas we had and the pain points we were seeing in the industry and articulate them with technology solutions that, quite honestly, I personally would have never been able to, to come to exclusively, right? I needed mm -hmm. that level of expertise yeah. in, the, in the management and the executive team. And the first thing that we did that was revolutionary in the industry, had never been done before, was we took our music search technology, which at that point tons of competitors had, and we designed mm -hmm. it fundamentally for integration. What that meant was that other massive media companies that had hundreds of millions of users in some cases that needed music could take our music search technology integrate it into their system via the cloud and deploy our music licensing solutions and our content for their end users, right? So the, we call that yeah. a MASS platform. And MASS is a trademark of audio sockets. It stands for Music as a Service. And again, it's just our music search technology as an API. At the time, nobody else yep. had ever done that. And the first deployment of it was with Vimeo, which is one of the largest video hosting sites in the world. Uh, and it was a several right. moment for the company, obviously. Absolutely, and this open versus closed or, or walled garden approach that a lot of the traditional media companies have taken, and, and here you're opening it up to the marketplace, allows you to, to, to create that awareness, one, right, and, and build uh, uh, this uh, uh, supply chain of, of partners uh, to, to get your, uh, your, your service out there. Right, I mean, Dave. That's is exactly it. You hit it on the head. Uh, let's shift a little bit. Where did you see Brent when we're talking about the technology and seeing some of the the trends? You know, all these start all of the startups have a, uh, have tough times. I mean, it's it's a struggle. You see all the glory of of these big visible successes, but most of the companies are in the trenches for a defined period of time, and and they get um, uh, a break or you know, overcome a huge obstacle. Talk to us a little bit about maybe one or both of those areas that you realized with AudioSocket. Yeah, so it's come in waves, right? And <clears throat> there's been different, I guess, achieved milestones or periods of evolution in the company that have been pivotal anchor points. And the first one for us was when we actually, the day that we looked, realized we were not a music company, that had tech, we were a tech company that had music. Um, and that was really in finding our original CTO, John Barnett. Um, you know, the second one, at that point, we were essentially collaborating together with a really engaged, uh, striving to innovate uh, executive team. And then as we built the mass platform internally, we loved it. We thought it was going to revolutionize the industry certainly kind of give our competitors a run for their money, but it was still speculative, right? Uh, yeah, right. the, day that, the day that Vimeo signed the agreement with us and launched it and TechCrunch picked up the story and all the rest, it became clear that it was no longer audio socket professing we're a tech company in the music space, right? Uh, it was the industry had responded. Yes, they are. Major mm -hmm. validity. And then beyond that, you know, we started rolling out additional partnerships 
shortly after Vimeo, uh, the Associated Press called us, right? And they said, hey, we love what you're doing with Vimeo. And I bet we've not seen anything like this in the space yet. We're licensing a ton of still images. We're licensing a ton of stock video content. Our customers need music. Can we use your technology and distribute your content to our end users, right? Um, you know, that was another, like, that was the third wave, if you will, mm-hmm. right, of kind of audio sockets just continuing to rise. And then most recently, and I think this, quite honestly, is the most powerful for us, um, we announced a new technology a couple of months ago. I think we, we announced it in September. It's called License ID. And, um, you know, what License ID does is essentially encodes inaudible data into a song file that outlines all the details of a license. So the, li- the, the licensor, you know, the record label or whomever, the rights holder, can track where their copyrights go in digital, in digital media, but then platforms, be it you know, a YouTube or a Vimeo or whomever that's using the license ID decoder, they can know with automation not only is there music in this video, but the rights have been cleared. So kind of enabling mm-hmm. them to bypass some of the issues that you've seen in the press with flawed systems like content ID and the rest, right? Yeah, and yeah. We, had, we announced this um, in September. We started to deploy it in our own systems in December. But, I mean, immediately we started getting phone calls from major broadcast networks, from all the major publishers, the larger record labels, right? And mm-hmm. I mean, I, I I see an opportunity for the industry finally to um, instead of looking to the outside world, the music business has never thought like a tech company, and that's exactly why it's in the space of them, right? Right, um, right. This is an opportunity for the music industry to stake claim and say, you know what? We're not going to look for other industries to solve our tech problems. We're going to solve them for ourselves. And when Audio Socket announced License ID, the response we got from the industry and the adoption, quite honestly, that we've gotten on the product since launch has been tremendous. And right mm-hmm. now, we are underway in creating a new industry standard in licensing rights identification and verification, which gives consumers who license properly the ability to get their content out there without being threatened by platforms that want to pull it down and give copyright owners the opportunity to finally police their own work to make sure they're being compensated when their copyrights are used. Brilliant. And that's an embedded technology that you call uh, License ID. Yeah, License ID is what it's called, LID for short. Uh, Mm -hmm. You know, in the software business, people are always trying to make acronyms. (laughs) Um, (laughs) Right. So, yeah, I mean, that's where it's at. And our first uh, big partner, if you will, is a company called Source Audio. They're strictly a platform company, distributes the music licenses for, I think, about 3,000 different stock libraries. So they're integrating license ID into their system now. Expected to roll it out uh, early in the fourth quarter if we get lucky, late in the third. But at that time, we're going to be encoding the majority of the licenses issued in the world with LID metadata. It's tremendous. Wow. And it really seems like that's just the tip of the iceberg of what's potentially very valuable with that type of technology. I'm sure you can... Certainly. Yeah, we started it with music, Dave, but, you know, we architected the technology to provide the same copyright verification and protection for any type of digital media asset. So music, stock video, stock images, fonts, you name it. Um, You know, if there's there's digital content and there are rights and permissions associated with it, the license ID technology is architected to provide the verification and the authentication of those rights. Fantastic. It, change, well, it changes the uh, profile of our company quickly. It's exciting. Yeah, yeah. Well, I was just going to say that that's uh, that, that that becomes a, a very large uh, endeavor. You know, when you when you start looking at all the potentials for it, and and, and kind of stepping back a second, Brent, uh, with regards to uh, uh, Audio Socket. What, the company is based in New Orleans now, or is it Seattle still, or where, where are you guys good located? Good question. Yeah, that's a good question. So I started it in Seattle with my business partner in 2009 and opened a satellite office in New Orleans almost immediately. And then about two years ago, I moved the headquarters from Seattle to New Orleans, and I took the tech team with me. And while many people will say, are you crazy? You went from a tech hub down to New Orleans? Uh, there was a lot of reasons for that. Beyond New Orleans being my home, 
and that I wanted to come home again and I wanted to eat my grandmother's red beans and rice, which I assure you the best <laughs> in the world. Um, you know, the other main impetus for this was the fact that Louisiana created some incentives. They created the Angel Investor Tax Credit, which provided up to 35% back to all investors that invested in Audio Socket cash on their investment over a five-year period. Um, and then secondly, they created another incentive called the Digital Media Tax Credit, which provides us up to 35% back from the state on all of our tech uh, expenses, tech hires, salaries, et cetera. So, you know, as a young startup, lean, uh, you know, not unbelievably over, you know, uh, flush with cash, right? Uh, those incentives, uh, mm-hmm. along with the mm-hmm. fact that I wanted to be home and I wanted my grandmother's red beans and rice, really encouraged me to kind of bring the headquarters home. So we did that. And I think it was 2012, I guess, towards the end of 2011. And we've got basically our tech team in New Orleans, marketing, business development, myself. And in Seattle, we have essentially our finance office, our artist relations department, music classification department. And then we've got uh, sales teams out in New York, um, Los Angeles, and uh, got actually one rep in the Midwest out in Colorado. And New Orleans is a great, great city. We, we, uh, we love it. So let's shift now from the company to Tech Week. You're a speaker at Tech Week. How and why are you part of the Tech Week event? Yeah, I mean, that's, that's a really good question. Um, they had, I, I, I believe some of the organizers of Tech Week had seen the recent press announcements uh, an audio socket most specifically related to license ID and considering not only kind of the shift in digital media, but also some of the challenges with distribution and video on the web. Um, I think that, that license ID piece and the fact that we're kind of dealing with rights administration and music uh, in technology was kind of the, the deciding factor in, in, in why they invited Audio Socket to play a role uh, on the panel. So on that front, then, the license ID is solving some pretty critical challenges in the music slash technology space. Uh, maybe talk a little bit about what those trends are. I mean, we know a lot of them are about piracy, and they've been out there forever. Uh, talk a little bit about where the current state of, of your industry is now? Yeah, certainly. I mean, as it relates to video on the web, it's, it's just a pretty big shift. I mean, obviously, back in the day, you know, if you wanted to create video and have it broadcasted, you needed to have a you know, multi-million dollar budget and some friends that worked at NBC, right? And, and all of that has completely been flattened and <laughs> democratized, um, which is thankful. But it's also created a bit of the wild, wild west. So we know that according to a study that came out last week and was published by the RIAA, which is a, you know, essentially a, a member group for the, the music business, um, music piracy is about a $12.5 billion a year problem, which is big, but about $2.5 billion of that is directly related just to music publishing losses as it pertains to music being synced to video, right? So there's 100 mm-hmm. hours of video being uploaded to YouTube alone every minute of the day. Now, let me just state that again for your listeners in case yeah, I please. kind of glossed over. 100 <laughs> hours of video being uploaded to YouTube every minute of the day, mm-hmm. right? So it's a staggering amount of content. And obviously, a lot of that has music, and a lot of, obviously a lot of that music is being used inappropriately or without permissions, and that, that's fine, and there's certainly – some methodology that has been put in place to compensate rights holders, you know, YouTube specifically, not to pick on them for any reason, but obviously they're the biggest guys out there. You know, they have a system called Content ID, and Content ID can tell you if there is music in your video, but it can't tell you if it was properly licensed. So what they did, to their credit, and try to help you know rights owners get compensated, is they said, look, we're going to use a fingerprinting technology. If we find music in a video, we're going to scan the video, we're going to find it. And if you are cool with that video going up there, Mr. Warner Records, then that's great. We're just going to pay you a percentage of, of the ad revenue. <clears throat> and that's all good and fine, but, you know, sometimes the right holder doesn't know, well, yeah, there's, there's my, my music is in that video, but is that video potentially libelous? Is it 
violent? Is it something that is not appropriate for the artist? So even if they're making money mm-hmm. off it, it may not be good for their brand. Uh, secondly, since the content ID system can only tell you if there's music in the video and not if, if it's been licensed, let's say Warner licenses a, a song to Mercedes Benz for uh, you know their YouTube video. Well, now when Mercedes uploads a video, Content ID is going to flag that video saying it's got music from Warner in it, and it's going to start to run ads against it, which could be ads from, I don't know, Nissan or Ford, right? Right, so, right. So while these technological advancements were intended to improve upon piracy, and they certainly did to a degree, they were incremental, and they were inherently flawed. Because if you can only identify music being in a file, but you can't identify what rights are related to it, then you inevitably kind of abuse the people who license properly and then let those who may, have been, who may be properly uh, licensed, using music without a license skirt through the system unscathed. Um, you know, really the industry finally is coming together and saying, what can we do to, to continue to evolve and improve on these things? And it's not just audio soccer with license ID. I mean, again, and I, I'm very proud of our team for what we've done there, but, you know, this week, uh, my business partner and, and dozens of other people uh, were at a roundtable discussion hosted by, uh, the, you know, the part of the Senate that is working to re- consider and potentially update copyright laws, right? So you've got right. a number of stakeholders across the industry, folks from Google, um, you know, copyright attorneys, the U.S. government itself, music licensing companies and rights holders like Audio Socket and, um, you know, music dealers and, uh, you know, right. other universal records and the rest, all coming around the table and going, you know what, digital media has changed and it, it's just growing at such an alarming rate we as a society need to come together and reevaluate copyright law to make sure it's protective of both, uh, you know, rights holders, but also protective of free speech and protective of, of, of creativity and, and general expression mm-hmm. in society. Uh, and I think that's the trend, and that's a, that's a great place to be because I think it's about 15 years late, quite honestly. They should have been yeah, having you're right. <laughs> the day Napster came out, and they're just now Hey, here we are, and I think that's a success, you know. Well, and you, you can't accuse the uh, the, the uh, government. I mean, we like to beat up on the government, but you can't accuse the government for uh, for rushing in anything too quickly uh, yeah. when it's important. But but a little late, I think, is uh, is typical. And yeah, 15 years at least, right? Where uh, where copyright should have been uh, addressed and 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 trying to align this. A lot of it's uh, being decided in the courts. Um, we, we uh, you know, with with uh, rights holders in general. So the more tools, the better that can can define the playing field for all the constituents. Uh, that's a good thing. So audio socket and, and your technology uh, ultimately is it, it helps. Nobody wants to litigate and defend themselves from a lawsuit or you know have to sue somebody. It's just too costly. So the right. more that the uh, playing field can be leveled with tools like your, your, yourselves, uh, you know what you have there is is uh, a good thing. Yeah, I, sure. I believe generally people are good. You know, make it affordable, make it yeah. understandable, and people yeah. want to do the right thing. You know. So these trends are are you know they're they're moving. There's a lot of counter trends. There's a lot of uh, similar trends in in different areas. Um, What's the state of music in general like these days, just overall? Yeah, from my perspective, it's, it's thriving from a creativity uh, end, right? I mean, there's just so mm-hmm. many great artists, and the technology um, required to you know, capture really good songs has become more affordable and therefore more available. I think you're seeing um, people take two instruments more and really choosing to use mm-hmm. Uh, you know, both mm-hmm. analog as well as the digital tools that are available now to, to create and express themselves. And I believe that the consumer market is, is bigger than it's ever been. I mean, people uh, have so many outlets to just find the music they want, you know, channels like YouTube, subscription services like, you know, Spotify and RDO and uh, obviously Beat, which Apple just acquired. And, uh, you know, and, and, and even the internet radio innovation through companies like Pandora. I mean, there's a ton of content being created, and there, there's more consumers for it than ever. Um, certainly, yeah. the, the revenue is down 
industry wide, but I, I think it's just because they're again finally catching up 15 years later to how to monetize in the digital world where people will no longer be forced to buy overly priced uh, pieces right. of plastic. Right. Exactly. And then what about the indie music? The state of the independence out there? Um, you know, there's some news today that they're potentially getting threatened. I, I don't know how much the audience paid attention to some of the rumors that were flying around, um, you know, YouTube and their new subscription service. Uh, you know, I, I think most of that is, is hyperbolic, and I don't really believe that that um, the independents are going to be pushed out like that. But at the end of the day, all you have to do is look at guys like Macklemore, right? I mean, how many Grammys did yeah. he win? Um, he's he's going independent, right? Um, right. You know, look at look at other guys like uh, Radiohead who have gone from you know the you know, Nine Inch Nails, you know, super iconic major label artist, who are now saying, no, everything going forward, gonna do it independent. So, you know, not only do you have those legacy artists, you know, becoming independent, maybe for the first time in their lives, but you've got independent artists who are becoming famous and choosing to remain independent. If that doesn't highlight kind of the strength of the indie movement overall, I, I don't know what does. I think, you know, technology yeah. has again made the world flat and people can get out there and be successful if they've got the right mindset and they're writing most importantly great songs and they got a work ethic and uh, mm -hmm. they can get their music out there and be heard like never before. And that to me is a thriving indie, indie sector. Yeah, it's a great point, uh, Brent, and uh, I think it's it's one that uh, gets lost a lot of times when you know you see a headline. But things are thriving. People want to move as close to the customer as possible. Um, I know our network, what we're building, is uh, built direct, so it allows the owners and all the rights holders to go direct to the consumer as as quickly as possible. I think that's. Uh, the shortest path is the best path. You build a direct relationship with your audience. And, and so these trends are, are moving, you know, various parts of the creative industry and the tech industry. And, uh, but, but you're right. It, it ultimately, you have to have a good product. You have to have the rights issues uh, managed and, uh, and provide value along the, uh, the, the consumer chain. Uh, and, and if you do that, you're always going to have a market out there. So, yeah, so I that agree. It's never, it's yep. never easy, yep. but certainly <clears throat> everything you just said is, is absolutely true. Yeah, and, and and so the future of your industry now, of of uh, what we call it the rights management industry or the licensing industry, would you say? Yeah, I mean, I, you know, I, I think certainly we're playing in the rights management and, and licensing space, um, at least where it intersects with okay. technology. So where where do you see that then? Than heading is it is it becoming a uh, you know a, a, a one company uh, w w you know or, or several big companies will it be uh, you know services that fit in underneath the big traditional licensing agencies the BMIs you know the ACFs all these other groups that are out there I mean we're because it, it's it's a very you're, that industry has always kind of been a uh, kind of a cloudy gray area for people, consumers, and really artists, frankly, is, you know, how do things get licensed? How do, how do these rates get agreed upon? You know, where, what are some of the, the, the future of path, you know, future trends for your industry? Yeah, I mean, that's a good question. I, I think a lot of that's being figured out now, and, and what Congress is doing, the whole of the copyright roundtable sessions and kind of revisiting copyright law is a big part of, of where that's going to go, you know. As far as, okay. I don't have a crystal ball, but in my opinion, I do believe that there's, there's becoming a greater willingness for the industry as well as the legislators in general to uh, finally create the best practice to get all the right information that's available uh, kind of consolidated so it's transparent to the consumers. You know, right now... If you want to go license a song from 1962 from an artist who maybe had one hit, whoever that might be, but they're dead and their great grandchildren have some part of the rights, you don't you don't know who to call anymore. <laughs> in most right, cases. right. So you know if the music industry or you know any rights uh, you know holders, they don't have their own act and data together, then you don't really have much of a leg to stand on when it comes to demanding that the market respect your rights. If they don't know how to go and secure the proper rights, 
um, you know, you can't fuss at them for not doing it correctly. So I believe right. the industry is starting to acknowledge that and is having much more spirit of willingness to consolidate that data and to make that data available. And that, coupled with education to consumers, as well as tied together by technologies that, that enable the legal and proper and fair use of, mm-hmm. you know, creative mm-hmm. works. When those three things play well together, society collectively, I just believe, is going, is going to be able to express more, create more, and just have a hell of a lot more fun. Perfect. Perfect. Well said. And, and it's a good lead into my next question, which is if I'm looking at the AudioSocket platform the, at AudioSocket.com, walk me through, uh, you know, the, the, the use case of, of a user on your site, what, what they'll, they'll, ex- they'll come to expect when they, they, they go there. Yeah, certainly. So, I mean, you know, if you just go to AudioSocket.com, you're going to very quickly get a sense that we are a company that loves music. And we have worked day and night uh, with a great staff to consolidate and curate some of today's most cutting independent artists in every possible genre, anything from folk music to singer-songwriter to death metal and, and everything in between. Um, I think the impression you get here is that while we want to provide creative tools, fundamentally we realize the technology is the anchor of that, right? And Mm -hmm. when Mm -hmm. you go from audiosocket.com, instantly at the top of the page, you can just start searching for music right there. There's no tell us who you are or prove that you're worthy of accessing this stuff. (laughs) We just trust you. You know what I mean? You want to find good music, you're going to do it right. Here it is, explore. And you can explore by a number of ways. You can, like you would at Google, just type in uh, a keyword in the search bar, I want rock music or I want something that sounds like, you know, Arcade Fire, whatever the case may be. Yep. Or if you're not really yep. sure what keywords to use, um, then we provide some search navigation tips for you. It's pick a genre. You know, you can pick a genre. You can pick rock. Well, then there's 20 different subgenres of rock. You know, you, do you want heavy rock? Yeah. Do you want 80s rock? Do you want 60s rock? Or do you want alternative rock or indie rock? Um, right. Well, uh, Brett, I'm right now in the in the cage. I'm sorry, I'm in the Cajun section. So, and I'm I'm screenshotting this um, just for our listeners. But in the Cajun, you have a search area called the roster, and that allows you to even search deeper into your vertical, right? Is it, yeah, I understand absolutely. That? Yeah, and when you click tempos. roster, you're just you're into the entire catalog right there. You've got sixty thousand plus songs at your fingers. Great. And so if I, let's say I'm a user and I pick one of these, I just uh, favorite it, and then I can start an account where I can build a library of my, uh, my content choices. And basically it makes it real easy to just click on the shopping cart and, uh, and start uh, purchasing it, correct? Yeah, exactly. So what we've done is we've standardized a lot of license pricing and rights for you know, consumer and small business use, right? So... If you're, you know, a dad, you're filming your kid's soccer game, like you buy a personal license for a couple of bucks. Um, you know, if you're a small business, you own an ice cream shop in downtown Chicago and you want to do a web video to promote your latest flavor, your business, buy a small business license and, you know, have rights for the web. Um, mm-hmm. You know, again, just democratizing licensing. Now, of course, we still issue licenses to, you know, large brands and advertising agencies yeah. and broadcast networks. Uh, and those are done via kind of a human interaction and not what we call the storefront. But, you know, we sure. believe that all people want to create content and all of them should be able to do it in an easy and affordable way with the highest quality music available. Right, right. And it, it really is very easy to use. And kudos to your, your team for building a very uh, nice look and, and uh, user-friendly approach to, to licensing music. I mean, this is a, g- a given. We're We're going to do it the right way. I mean, the traditional way of kind of mashing together different things uh, is, is, you know, it takes a risk. And ultimately, it's, it's, it's not the, the, the proper way for the creators that are creating this content uh, and, and uh, allowing it to, to be there in the first place. So you want to reward the folks that are creators, and, uh, and, and this is uh, a great platform to, to, uh, to do that and, and do the right thing. So, um, yeah, we're, we're just uh, doing some screenshots with some of the, the tabs and going through uh, the uh, very easy-to-use 
interface on audiosocket.com. So um, I'm going to switch one more time on you now because uh, we're running out of time. I'd like to go into a little bit about you personally or through audiosocket.com, some of the, the, the causes that you support or that you're interested in that's uh, uh, friendly to the, 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 the population or the community at large. What are, what are some of the things you're doing, Brent? Yeah, certainly. I mean, you know, <clears throat> being a music lover that I am, I mean, it was why we started the company, uh, you know, in the first place. It's whatever we can do to give back to artists. And obviously being successful in our own business provides very real value to indie artists who are looking for ways to create a sustainable living. I wouldn't really call that philanthropic as much as just a core value of why Audio Socket exists. We we just believe fundamentally that today's artists who work hard to become masters of their instrument and write good songs, they, they have the right to a sustainable career. And yeah. every day yeah. we work to, to enable that. Now, as far as directly philanthropic things, we, you know, we're a young startup, so we have to be lean about it. But, you know, whenever we can, um, you know, we sponsor other creative endeavors that give back uh, to artists in general. You know, one example is Nifty, which is uh, the National Film Festival for Talented Youth. This is a very large community of filmmakers, 10,000 plus, all of them under the age of 21, from around the world looking to tell stories that impact their audiences. And, you know, they're young filmmakers. They don't have any money. They don't have any budget, right? So every year I make sure to go out of our way to provide them the tools and the resources at no cost uh, to use the music that they need to tell those great stories for the Nifty Film Festival. Um, beyond great. that, the Jazz and Heritage Festival, also known as just Jazz Fest here in New Orleans, they do a conference every year called Think Up. And all Think Up is designed to do is three days of incredibly engaging panel discussions with experts in the industry from touring to management to labels to distribution, you name it. It's a free conference, and they invite artists from around the world to come in to sit down and to learn for three days. And, uh, you know, I've seen record deals get signed there. I've seen touring deals get signed there. I've just seen artists learn new information that allows them to develop their careers. And we sponsor that event every year. I mean, not only oh, because we're great. friends of Jazz Fest, but because we want to give back to the indie artists. We want to give them the tools and the resources. And that's a great conference that's worth probably at least 500 bucks a ticket. And we mm. want to help them keep it free. And, uh, you know, those are the things that we do to give back today. Yeah. And uh, yeah. I look forward to doing more. Yeah. Well, it, it really is, uh, uh, to your point, I mean, lots of ways to give back. All of us can find a way. Uh, there is a reason why the term starving artist is so pervasive. And it's unfortunate that being a creative person these days uh, means that you have to live a life of lack to a lot of people, you know. Right. I know the, the dream's always there, but it would be uh, great if more creatives could be uh, living that sustainable life, as you, you called it. So uh, hats off uh, to, to doing uh, your part uh, and, uh, and helping those causes and those audiences. And uh, shout out to, to Jazz Fest in general and what sounds like a really great film festival, the Nifty, your neck of the woods. By all means, if any listeners are in those neck of the woods when those events are happening, uh, definitely uh, check them out because they're, they're world class. And that you're, so you're coming up uh, next week. You're speaking on which day? Saturday the 28th. All right, 28th at noon. Yeah, so the, we, Saturday the 28th at 12.30 p.m. <laughs> Great. All right, good. So it's Saturday, 1230, June 28th. And the topic of your uh, talk is? The title of the, of the panel is called Video Killed the Radio Star. How <laughs> nice. to, uh, the rise of video sharing websites has changed the music industry. And it should be a great one. And I know we'll be talking to some of the other panelists as well. And we'll touch base with you shortly before or after and, and follow up with you then. But... Uh, we ask this to everybody, any favorite thing about Chicago? And I know this is, is going to be uh, your first trip into the city. So you, we'll give you a break and say anything that you've heard about Chicago that you'd like to check out uh, well, as an experience. I, I, I don't know that I'll be able to see it on Saturday, um, but as an Irishman, the fact that you all turned the river green on St. Patty's Day, <laughs> I have great admiration for that. 
Um, yeah. And at a, at a minimum, you know, I, I look forward to that <laughs> here. Yeah. Um, well, I'll tell you one thing, Brett, is that it's a very similar situation to Jazz Fest or Mardi Gras, where it's a, it's a celebration, right? It's right. a city celebration, and uh, it, it's however we can we can get ours in the cities uh, that we live in is important. So, next uh, next uh, St. Patty's Day, you're welcome to come back and uh, and see it live. So, we want to want to thank Brett McCrossin from AudioSocket.com. We want to thank you for for taking the time out of your day to. Uh, educate us, uh, share some, some of your path and your story, uh, to uh, tell us a little bit about the industry that you're in, the uh, music business, technology, and audiosocket.com. I invite, invite everybody to, to check it out. Uh, it, it really is a great uh, site. Um, anything that you want to end with, uh, and you know, uh, leave it there. You know, Dave, I would just say, most importantly, thank you for your time and Chicago's listeners. Um, I really am incredibly excited to arrive in your great city uh, later next week, and I'm already, thanks to Dave, feeling the hospitality uh, and the red carpet extended. So thank you so much for today. I appreciate it. Sure, Brent. Thanks very much. That's, again, Mr. Brent McCrossin from audiosocket.com. Thanks, everybody.